Although pneumonia is one of the most common conditions that we treat, there are still a lot of little nuances that I think a lot of people get wrong. And so in this video, I want to give you my basic approach to treating pneumonia and also give you a lot of handy tips uh, about common pitfalls to avoid. So the first thing that we need to do is really differentiate between community-acquired pneumonia and hospital-acquired pneumonia or ventilator-associated pneumonia. Now, one of the first mistakes that most people make is there was this outdated terminology uh, that was called HCAP or health, healthcare associated pneumonia. And this is actually something we should no longer be using. So instead of saying somebody has healthcare associated pneumonia because they lived in a nurse, nursing home or they saw like a clinic visit uh, a week ago and they need to get broader spectrum antibiotics, this is no longer something that we need to do. And rather, it's just differentiating between CAP and hospital-acquired pneumonia or ventilator-associated pneumonia. So what's the biggest difference between community-acquired and hospital-acquired? Well, the big difference, obviously, is uh, you know where they developed this pneumonia. And hospital-acquired pneumonia is when somebody has been in the hospital for greater than 48 hours, and then they subsequently develop a pneumonia, then this is uh, defined as HAP, and they will require broader spectrum antibiotics. And then ventilator-associated pneumonia is if clearly if they're on it, you know, intubated, then they will also need broader spectrum antibiotics. So the treatment for community-acquired pneumonia actually varies quite a lot, and it's one of the common things that most new learners don't have a solid understanding of. At least when I was an intern, I remember not really knowing the progression of how to choose which antibiotics. And so uh, there's a couple of different ways to categorize this. And the first one that we start with is outpatient treatment. So if somebody's got pneumonia, but they don't need to be hospitalized, then we take a look at whether they are completely healthy or if they have major medical comorbidities. So medical comorbidities. And this is going to alter what treatments we choose for these patients. So if they're completely healthy, then we do what's called monotherapy. And so that would be monotherapy with either a beta-lactam, doxycycline, or macrolide like azithromycin. On the other hand, if they have medical comorbidities, even something as simple as diabetes, then that would qualify them for combination therapy. And by, by combination therapy, we're talking about the combination of a beta-lactam with uh, doxycycline or azithromycin. You could also use a fluoroquinolone uh, like levofloxacin or moxifloxacin as well, uh, but typically you're going to reserve that for situations where you can't do the combination therapy for some reason. Now let's move on to inpatient management. And inpatient, again, is going to have this kind of two-tiered uh, approach where you have somebody with typical community-acquired pneumonia, so no risk factors for MRSA or in Pseudomonas. And then you'll have patients who do have risk factors for uh, these infections. And this typically re revolves around whether they've had a prior history of MRSA, Pseudomonas, uh, if they've had recent antibiotics, any structural lung disease or IV drug use or things like that. And the treatment for this is most often uh, for the inpatient side of things, again, is going to be a combination therapy of a beta-lactam plus doxy or azithro. Again, you could do a fluoroquinolone as well. The big difference here is clearly uh, this patient's hospitalized, so they can actually get IV uh, medications. So whereas for this combination therapy as an outpatient where you would do something like Augmentin and Azithromycin, uh, on the inpatient side, you could do IV ceftriaxone, which is definitely going to be the most common uh, thing that you're going to see here, plus azithromycin or doxycycline. Uh, and again, fluoroquinolone only reserved if they have like a really bad penicillin allergy or something like that. Now, one of the things to differentiate between azithromycin and doxycycline is azithromycin tends to be the one we reach for first, but if they have significant QT prolongation, uh, that would be uh, one of the more common scenarios in which we would opt for doxycycline instead because it has doesn't have that side effect of QT prolong prolongation. One thing I forgot to mention earlier is that actually monotherapy as an outpatient, uh, we actually are starting to favor doxycycline a little bit more than azithromycin uh, because uh, there's higher rates of macrolide resistance in the community. And so that's one thing to keep in mind. Now, if they do have risk factors for MRSA and Pseudomonas, then we're definitely going to need to add coverage for those things. And so risk factors for uh, Pseudomonas or MRSA, typically we're going to reach for something with anti-pseudomonal coverage, so cefepime or zosin. And then for that MRSA coverage, we would add on vancomycin. So I really want to emphasize uh, just getting like nailing this down. So outpatient healthy people, just one drug, uh, either beta-lactam, doxy, or azithro. 
uh, medical comorbidities, let's do combination therapy. And then inpatient, we're going to do IV ceftriaxone and azithro. Uh, and then with risk factors for MRSA pseudomonas, we'll do something like cefepine or rizosin instead. Now for hospital acquired pneumonia and ventilator associated pneumonia, essentially all of these patients are going to have a risk factor for pseudomonas because they've been in the hospital for 48 hours. So all of these patients should be given an anti-pseudomonal, uh, for example, zosin or ceph uh, cefepime. If a patient is sick or high risk for mortality, uh, then the, you should add on a second anti-pseudomonal and also add MRSA coverage as well. Typically for the second anti-pseudomonal, it's going to be an aminoglycoside, so you're getting a separate mechanism of action, or a fluoroquinolone. So aminoglycoside like amikacin or gentamicin or fluoroquinolone, and then MRSA coverage would be with vancomycin. One thing that we actually do quite commonly in the hospital is we're actually going to swab the patient's uh, nares or their nostrils for to see if they're colonized with MRSA. And a lot of these patients are going to be straight up treated with vancomycin. You always feel okay giving like a dose or two of vancomycin and then peeling back if they don't need it. Uh, but what that's going to do is when you swab their nose for MRSA and you wait a couple of days and the result comes back negative, that actually helps you discontinue the vancomycin very early because you know the patient is not colonized uh, with methicillin resistant staph. So check mercenaires to help de-escalate. And then finally, I want to talk about duration because uh, this is a very, very key point and you're going to be asked about this a lot, but the duration of antibiotics for hospital acquired pneumonia is going to be seven days, a flat seven days. And all the time you're going to think, wow, these patients are really sick. Maybe we need to do 10 to 14 days, but there's actually been multiple studies that have shown that seven days is non-inferior to longer treatment durations. So this is another common mistake that you should avoid, which is prescribing too long of a duration of antibiotics. All right, let's zoom out a little bit, and then I want to talk a little bit more about some of the most common mistakes that I see uh, when we are treating hospital-acquired pneumonia and community-acquired pneumonia. So first of all, I'd like to mention that most of these are based off the 2019 IDSA guidelines or the Infectious Disease Society of America guidelines. And so that's where you're going to find a lot of this evidence and recommendations from. And it's always really helpful to review those uh, guidelines to figure out how to treat pneumonia the best way possible. One of the most common issues that comes up is, should we be ordering blood cultures or sputum cultures for patients, as well as Legionella and Strep Pneumo urine antigens? Based on the 2019 IDSA guidelines, these are only recommended if you have severe community-acquired pneumonia. And severe, uh, we're talking about you know needing to go to the ICU, a really, really elevated a respiratory rate, shock, things like that. And then, so this is one of the most common mistakes is that we just kind of blindly order all of these for all patients. But really, you should only reserve it for severe community-acquired pneumonia or patients with risk factors for MRSA or pseudomonas. So only for severe CAP or MRSA pseudomonas suspicion. Another huge one that we check all the time, and this is probably gonna be one of the biggest contention points of this video, is checking a procalcitonin. So what is procalcitonin? It's a marker of bacterial disease and inflammation. And so a lot of times we check it to make sure that, you know, we're actually treating a bacterial infection and to confirm our suspicion. The 2019 IDSA guidelines actually does not recommend procalcitonin uh, to guide initial antibiotic therapy. Now, there is some uh, people who use procalcitonin to determine when to discontinue uh, antibiotic therapy, but I'm going to make a separate video that even that practice is really not that useful. And so for me, I'm somebody who actually does like to get procalcitonin because it, it is nice to see that number coming down when you're treating it appropriately and you see things are getting better. But in basically every scenario, it's not going to change management and therefore there's no reason to check procalcitonin. The reason that I say that there's not really that much utility for determining when to stop antibiotics is also because a lot of these treatment durations are already predefined at this point. Like for community-acquired pneumonia, we tend to do five to seven days of treatment. And for hospital-acquired and ventilator-associated pneumonia, we do a strict seven days uh, duration of treatment. So procalcitonin also does not really help us figure out when to stop antibiotics either. So that's why I included that there. An older mistake that I'm not really seeing that much of anymore is adding anaerobic coverage for aspiration pneumonia. 
Now, the previous thought was that a lot of the microorganisms that live in your oral flora tend to be anaerobic uh, organisms. And so if somebody's mechanism of pneumonia was that they aspirated, then they should be treated with an anaerobic coverage antibiotic. Now, that is not really shown to improve um, any outcomes. And so anaerobic coverage is not recommended for aspiration pneumonia. The only situations that you would want to consider adding anaerobic coverage is if there is an empyema, an abscess, or um, post-obstructive pneumonia, because those are all situations in which you actually could develop an anaerobic environment where anaerobes could thrive. But normally, the lungs, is a, it's a very aerobic of environment, so anaerobic uh, organisms are not going to be able to survive there in the typical scenario. So do not add anaerobic coverage unless abscess empyema, or post-obstructive. Again, that's not really something that I'm seeing a lot of people make a mistake of these days, but I do still sometimes see it, especially out in more of community hospitals. Uh, the next one is treating COVID and flu. So obviously one of the treatments we have for flu positive patients is Tamiflu or Oseltamivir. And one of the big mistakes that people make is thinking that if they've had greater than 48 hours of symptoms, that they are no longer uh, indicated to receive Tamiflu. And while that's true for a certain subset of healthy outpatients uh, that can be treated at home, any patient that is hospitalized, regardless of symptom duration, should be given Tamiflu. So say they had symptom onset 72 or even 96 hours ago, if they're getting hospitalized, you need to give them Tamiflu. The reason is because if somebody's getting hospitalized, they're pretty sick and you're not going to be, um, you know, hurting them by giving Tamiflu. You can only help in this situation. And so uh, when they're that sick, we want to just give Tamiflu because regardless of their symptom duration, that may be helpful. So in healthy patients, only if onset less than 48 hours. But then again, if anybody is older than age 65 or they have any uh, medical conditions, then at any point in the duration of their illness, they have an indication for Tamiflu. So if greater than 65 or risk factors indicated regardless of onset. Another thing that the 2019 IDSA guidelines uh, looked at was uh, the utility of getting follow-up x-rays uh, to ensure resolution of pneumonia. And basically, they had a strong recommendation against uh, getting follow-up x-rays, mainly because even if a patient has improved and their pneumonia has resolved, a lot of times the imaging findings of their pneumonia lag behind their clinical improvement. And so you may get an x-ray in two weeks and they're still going to have signs of pneumonia everywhere, even though the patient is completely back to normal and back to baseline. So there's no indication for follow-up imaging in these patients. Finally, there is some uh, growing evidence for the use of steroids in community-acquired pneumonia. There was a recent trial, I believe in 2023, which gave steroids for severe community acquired pneumonia like people who were on their way to the icu about to get intubated and actually uh, they had pretty good evidence that it improved outcomes for severe community acquired pneumonia so this one you should consider if severe community acquired pneumonia if you look at the 2019 idsa guidelines they basically just say don't use it for hospital acquired pneumonia uh, but keep in mind that those guidelines were released before this more recent evidence uh, was was done Let's talk about a few more things just to keep in mind for all patients. So vaccination is incredibly important for reducing uh, the risk of severe pneumonia, especially streptococcal pneumonia. And so patients, uh, all patients over the age of 65 should get PCV20. Uh, this is the pneumococcal vaccine. And this is really, really nice because it used to be this very, very complicated algorithm with two uh, vaccines, the PCV13 and the PPSV23. But now it's been greatly simplified by the fact of uh, having this PCV20 vaccine. And then anybody ages 19 to 64 with medical comorbidities should also get the PCV20 vaccine. A quick point or pearl about risk stratification. So a lot of times patients come into the clinic or they come into the ED and you're not sure, is this patient sick enough that they need to go into the hospital and be admitted or can I treat this patient outpatient? And so typically the risk scores that we use for this are called the CURB-65 
or the PSI, um, the pneumonia severity index. Now the CURB 65 tends to be what they use in the outpatient setting, um, for example, in the ED. And then uh, for the pneumonia severity index, that's usually what internists use because that's more of a, a, risk, a risk calculator for whether the patient needs to go to the ICU or not. So basically this is asking, does patient need to be admitted? And then this patient is kind of, this one's kind of asking, does this patient need ICU or not? Although it also talks about home and stuff, but that's kind of how these two scores are used. I want to talk about one quick thing that you're almost certain to be asked at some point in your uh, medical career, and that is the use of daptomycin for pneumonia. So some patients have MRSA pneumonia and they can't receive vancomycin for some reason. And so people ask, oh, can this patient get daptomycin? And the answer is no. And the reason for that, and you better burn this into your brain because it gets asked all the time, is uh, because daptomycin is inactivated by uh, pulmonary surfactant. Finally, let's talk about complications of pneumonia, and that's going to include things like a paranemonic effusion. So you can have a simple paranemonic effusion or a complicated paranemonic effusion, uh, or you can have an empyema. So you have simple, and then you have complicated, and then one of the subsets uh, of complicated paranemonic effusion, uh, if bacteria is found to be growing in there, is an empyema. And so this is one of the most common board questions they'll give you because they can give you this nice chart and show you what the pleural fluid looks like. And then they ask you, you know, what's the next step in management for this patient? So for a simple paranemonic effusion, you can just do antibiotics and let it self-resolve basically. But any complicated paranemonic effusion or empyema is going to need antibiotics plus drainage. Um, and then basically, uh, the way to differentiate between paranemonic effusion and a complicated paranemonic effusion is going to be its white blood cell count, its pH being less than 7.2, and its glucose being less than 60. All right, and that's basically it to my approach to treating pneumonia, and then also the most common pitfalls and mistakes that people make. Um, hopefully this video clears up a lot of those issues for you. Please leave any questions down in the comments below, and I'll see you in the next video, and peace.